Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Good morning in Cambodia, if you're joining us from Cambodia, and good evening if you're joining us from the United States. Since it's 3.30 a.m. in Paris, I very much doubt we have many listeners in Europe right now. But um, let's get started. Today, um, the title of our webinar is Contemporary Cambodian Cinema, Bopana Center and Independent Filmmaking. And our presenter is Professor Martin Guyot Bender. Um, and let me just say a few words about Martine before we ask her to begin her presentation. Since 1991, Martine has been a professor of contemporary French literature and film and an active member of the Cinema and Media Studies program at Hamilton College in New York. Her primary focus is on narratology and the study of textual forms. In, in 2023, earlier this year, Martine was a CKS fellow and she came to Cambodia twice in the spring to do her research for this project. Um, reading about Martine's background, it's interesting to see she came to Cambodian studies through French literature. Um, Martine received her undergraduate degree at Metz University in Northeast France and later went on to study her graduate program and earned her PhD from the University of Oregon in French literature and linguistics. Her dissertation was on the um, French writer Patrick Modiano, um, who received the Nobel Prize later in 2014 and has some interesting connections that Martine discovered with um, one of the topics of her seminar today, Ritipan. So we'll be looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, let's see. Um, so yes, in 2010, um, Martine discovered Ritipan's work um, at a film screening in Paris um, where she saw the film S21 and since then became very interested in his work, especially with regards to memory. Um, and the construction of memory and um, how its representations. Um, in this presentation, Martine will present her work um, centered on the present day art house cinema landscape in Phnom Penh, particularly the Bopana Audiovisual Research Resource Center. Um, the study raises questions regarding the present state of Cambodian cinema the constraints posed by short formats, potential government ban um, backing for art house films, and the broader challenge of engaging younger audiences with this form of cinematic art. With that said, let me gladly and proudly introduce Martine to begin her presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. And um, before I start anything, I want to give some uh, thank yous. Uh, I want to thank the selecting committee uh, at the Center for Khmer Studies. Um, I, it was a real surprise that I was selected. And I hope that what I've uh, done is uh, in line with, uh, you know, with this, the center and especially Samedi who is, had, was so efficient and so patient with me uh, during the uh, preparation, during the COVID uh, and, uh, and when I came. I also want to thank Hamilton College for its very generous sabbatical leave policy. And at Bopana Center, I want to, Thank the staff, the interns, and especially uh, Executive Director Sophia Cheap for uh, his insights, for his patience with me, also the time he gave me to discuss uh, the center. And I also spend a lot of time at the Cambodian Film Commission, um, and Cédric Eloy and uh, Shanda Rasso uh, were uh, fantastic, and they also spent a lot of time with me. So my... Um, um, my projects changed between uh, my the, the initial uh, proposal 
I was going to work on Riti Pan uh, film forms, and I was going to work on his legacy in uh, in Phnom Penh. And during COVID, a number of uh, um, uh, articles came out on Riti Pan, so I decided I was going to put him on the side and, and look at uh, Bhopana Center and also the uh, the new uh, the emerging uh, cinema in. Uh, over there. So I stayed two and a half months, as uh, you said, uh, I mean, two months plus two weeks later. And I can say that I spend my time chatting with people uh, over there all the time. I spoke, chit chat, I met uh, many filmmakers and meeting one made me meet another one and another one. So this is uh, what I'm presenting is still a work in progress in some ways because there's many more people I would like to meet and many I spoke with whom I would like to meet again. So, oh, I forgot my um, <laughs> my slides, I'm sorry. Uh, so first, a couple of disclaimers. I'm, uh, as you know, I'm not a specialist of. Uh, um, am I am I sharing now? Okay, sorry. Uh, I have a little technical issue. Share. Okay, are you, am I sharing now? Yes, yeah. okay, yes, okay, thank you. Um, so the, uh, uh, a couple of disclaimers, uh, perspective, um, this is a perspective an outsider. I'm uh, obviously not from Southeast Asia and I am not a specialist of uh, Asian studies either. The material and the observations may look naive to some of you who are uh, in, uh, the, the the field of uh, Southeast Asian uh, cinema. And also this is, as I said before, a work in progress because um, the, the, the situation of uh, cinema in Cambodia is moving every day and we don't know where it's going. Um, so this is where it all happened. This is uh, Phnom Penh, but I spent my two months pretty much in this little uh, area here. This is the Bopana Center. And this is the uh, uh, film commission, Cinehub, the coffee shop um, uh, right by the, uh, the commission. And across the street is the Department of Cinema, where I had uh, the privilege of having one interview, which was fantastic. So I was going from one place to the next, meeting um, uh, people at Bopana at first a lot, and then meeting uh, filmmakers in the um, uh, at the uh, the commission. So my presentation is divided in two parts. One is really on Bopana, the other one is on contemporary cinema, and I hope to be able to bridge both of them. Um, Okay, so just a few reminders for uh, those of you who are not uh, really um, informed of that. So there was a golden age of cinema in the 50s and early 70s uh, before the Khmer Rouge. And uh, the um, after that, during the Khmer Rouge period, period uh, many documents and films were destroyed or neglected beyond repair. So there was... Uh, things disappeared uh, virtually. Ritipan was a survivor of the camps and he then was a refugee in Thailand and in France where he graduated from the uh, very famous uh, film school called EDEC. And he graduated in 89, I think in some places they say 88, but the same. Starting in 1990, Pan's documentary on the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge uh, started to um, uh, come out and and they showed a lot of creativity. So what was interesting now that I've seen all these films is that we, the, in, in spite of the tragedy, in spite of the really hard uh, truth that he was showing, he put also a lot of effort in the cinematography. So all these films deal with uh, tragic circumstances, but they are made as beautiful films at the same time. In 2000, Pan collaborated with stateman and filmmaker Yu Panakar 
and excuse me for the bad pronunciation, um, that led to the government's support to open the uh, Bopana Audiovisual Resource Center, uh, which was supported by many foreign governments and many uh, organizations. So the, uh, the, uh, the center opened in 2006. Just uh, to frame uh, the, the center, uh, for me, it's uh, uh, it represents two historical symbols. One, of course, is the name, which everybody knows uh, in Cambodia, in honor of Aut Bopana, a 25-year-old uh, woman who was tortured and executed uh, during the Khmer Rouge. Of course, there were, you know, many more, but uh, this one gave the name to the uh, to the center. And the other one, which is maybe less known, is that the center opened in 2006, which was the official start of the uh, ECCC, the trials of the uh, Khmer Rouge. Um, right, so the first mission of the Popana is uh, the recovery of audiovisual memory. And they did this by collecting, uh, digitalizing, organizing, restoring, and making available all types of documents uh, that were given to the center. So the, the, the first mission was really archiving. Um, then slowly uh, more innovations came. So there were screenings of classic films and documentaries on Cambodia, speaker series, exhibitions, uh, organization of film events and festival with the, uh, the, the film commission and offsite screening in the provinces. And this one may be, all this of course is in Cambodia, but this one here is the newest uh, innovation and it's a free app on the history of Cambodia, a recent history of Cambodia, which anyone in the world can access. I have it on my phone and I uh, look at it uh, regularly. It's uh, great. The last in innovation uh, is the production department. And this is what is of special interest uh, to me. So production means making movies. However, um, I was told many times that this is not a film school. So I will tell you why um, it is some type of uh, film school anyway. It was launched in uh, 2010. And uh, very briefly, the way it functions is that there is 12 trainees, students, trainees selected each year for a 12 month period. And they uh, spend their time in Phnom Penh and on location where they film. And they produce uh, about 12 to 16 very short films, 10 minutes on one topic, which is uh, has been uh, selected by uh, the uh, by Bopana. So two of the projects that I, I watched uh, completely are uh, the uh, $1 project, which was done in 2015. And it's a series of 16 films of about seven to 10 minutes, showing the creativity of people who actually lived in 2015 on $1 a day. Um, and the second project, which uh, is uh, one of the most recent project in 2021, is this series of also, I can't remember if it's 15 films, but um, around 15 films on the Mekong River. Um, it can be the fisheries and the, uh, the, the environment and people living in poverty on the Mekong. And it uh, touches a very, a hard subject of the dams that are uh, uh, upstream. Now, this not film school uh, is doing a lot of film school like activities because the students are, um, they are trained in technique, in screenwriting, pre production, post production, editing, but also in best practice in documentary making. And um, best practice means involving the people, the protagonists that you are filming in the process. Uh, and I'll say a little more about this uh, later. Um, guest speakers, uh, also they also, the, the trainees also have uh, guest speakers uh, and, and talk about film theory. And the last thing that I found, I personally found really interesting was the group and teamwork dynamics. They work a lot on this because uh, filmmaking is 
much more than any other art, especially painting and writing, a team effort. So, oh, uh, my, uh, this is blocked. Can you help me do that? Okay, great. Thank you. So I see that Bupana, uh, so I could just speak about Bupana, but I see that Bupana had a great influence on the emergence of new cinema, uh, of uh, a certain type of emerging cinema for four reasons. And I will have one slide on each of the reasons. So once it's a place, it's very important to have a place. Uh, second, archives are stimulus for cinema, just for the past, not for the past. It has given a, a renewed sense of aesthetics and cinema uh, is also an agent, agent for social awareness. I'm sorry, I'm having problems. Uh... Okay, great. So the first impact was the place. Bupana is a physical place. And anybody who's been in Paris, gone to the uh, uh, Cinémathèque Française knows the importance of such a place. So for me, it was an oasis celebrating uh, audiovisual art form. And I put a picture here because they, are, they do have trees. This is the building. They have trees in the front, which is very rare uh, in, uh, in Phnom Penh, especially in that uh, part of the, uh, of the city. Um, so for me, it's also a stage because it's performing uh, cinema. It's not just archives. Uh, it, the exhibits, the um, the screenings, uh, the meeting of people for me looks like a stage where cinema is being performed every day. And the third part is that identity that the building and what happens in it is giving to uh, cinema in Cambodia. And I said here, it's merging the tangible, so objects and archives with um the intangible, which is the creativity and the mixing of people uh, who are in different roles in uh, in cinema. Um, so the second impact is archives that's the propeller for new cinema uh, by uh, creating a continuity. So the the archive part has created this bridge before between the past, before Khmer Rouge, and after by providing. Uh, visitors, filmmakers, public um, uh, students, images from before because they had disappeared in Cambodia and those that they have now were given by private donors or other organizations, but it's it's creating this bridge between two period, two periods, sorry. It is establishing a deeper connection to the past because it's un unveiling details of that past. And I'm just gonna give a few examples, uh, housing, uh, towns, country, uh, uh, food, uh, dance, of course, um, uh, clothes. So it, it is given giving a uh, kind of a proof that these things happen and how they happened. But it's also providing raw images for uh, new filmmakers, the uh, the some of them are using the images, and I'm thinking, of course, well, Ritipan, of course, did it, but also Kulikar Soto did it. I uh, used um, images, and I know of some documentaries that are made right now where they will be. Um, I mean, they're hoping to use some images, and finally, it is uh, it is unearthing uh, cinematic examples from Cambodia, like real homegrown Cambodian. So this doesn't mean that the new filmmakers want to mimic these films or that they want to, um, uh, you know, to, to copy them, but it's giving a backdrop to the work that they're doing. And it's a continuity is, is gonna be more evident with these, uh, these films. So the third impact that I see is aesthetics. So the uh, Cambodian, uh, um, sorry, the Bupana films have a special aesthetics, uh, uh, which is, uh, well, first thing, they're all human centric. Uh, in that I said, they are filmed from the vantage point of a five foot, kind of five foot tall uh, person. Uh, there's very little, um, it's, it's very natural. It, you just feel that you are with the protagonist. 
And the protagonists are, as I said earlier, very engaged in the uh, in the process. So that was that is also um, very um, very important. There's this, you know, you you re you are with the protagonist, and you don't feel that the protagonists are being taken advantage of at all. Uh, they're not being used. They're part of it. The second thing is a very subtle cin cinematography. Very little zooms, for example, but panoramics. So as you People in cinema know we, as human beings, cannot zoom, but we can we can do panoramics. Okay, so they are uh, also doing this. The, the cinematography is quite simple, and there's a search for authenticity um, because everything is uh, filmed on uh, in location with natural light and natural sound. And finally, uh, the fourth impact is to uh, to show in Cambodia that uh, cinema can be uh, an agent in social transition. So of course, in, uh, in Western countries, we've done that for a long, long time, but it was not the case in Cambodia. So now I'm going to bridge into the new cinema. So this is my, uh, my family portraits if in some ways. Uh, these are films that I saw people I met, not all of them. I did not meet Paul and Lee, uh, unfor unfortunately, but uh, this is just uh, for me to um, transit to the next, uh, um, the next part. So we have to know, we have to realize that in 2000, uh, two, three, four, when Ritipan was uh, thinking about Bupana, in Cambodia there was films, but there was no art house, cinema d'auteur at all. So golden age, zero, the, during the Vietnamese occupation, zero. Most of the films were uh, foreign films uh, coming from um, communist countries. The uh, the Khmer productions after 19, uh, 1990 was mostly dramas, horror, romance. And somebody said to me, too many films, not enough quality. And I think that's, uh, that, that was uh, uh, the, the feeling. So I gave you some images. So this doesn't mean that I uh, do not, you know, these films existed and it's, it's important. It's just, there was no art house, uh, socially conscious cinema. Um, so at the same time, when Ritipan was thinking about the Pofana, uh, he uh, there was these are the films that he he uh, had uh, that came out. So the Land of the Wandering Soul, two thousand, que la barque se brise, que la jonque s'en trouve, which was a telefilm in uh, uh, two thousand one. People of Angor, which was not on Angor, but the people working around Angor or living around Angor. Uh, the Burn Theater paper. So these were very well filmed, very uh, crafty uh, documentaries that were coming out exactly at the same time as the films that I just showed you before. So I made a, a very uh, simplistic uh, comparison of two types of cinema on the left, um, the golden age, which was all about glamour, fantasy, horror, the elite, heroism, tradition, and that was for uh, entertainment. This is very, um, this is very stereotypical, but um, there's some truth to this. The art house cinema that really started after uh, 2010 um, was more serious work of art. There was a, a real desire to 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 do art. Uh, it was a cinema of the people. Most of the films are not from on the elite, but more on uh, you know people in the street and people, uh, uh, the working class. Uh, there was a desire to do, document the real, the way people live. The question of independency is tricky because they were independent, yes, from the government, but dependent on donors, unfortunately, and it's a choice that uh, is uh, needs to be explored. And experimental in uh, in the filming, so not because of technique, but because of framing. And I gave you here a picture of um, uh, a million year by uh, Sonnet uh, De uh, Danek Danekson, which I find very beautiful. And there was some research for uh, some truth and reflection, not the truth, but 
a truth in the film, finding and digging and finding something. So uh, Bopana, three of the, uh, the Bopana trainees um, were, um, became a pretty, um, I'm not going to say famous doesn't mean anything, but they really came out as independent cinematographers. They may be more, but this is the, the ones that I uh, I was told to think about. So there's Kevin Neg first uh, with his two films on the white building in Phnom Penh. So last night I saw you smiling and white building. Uh, the, the story of these two films is very interesting because white building was started first. If I if my information is correct, uh, as a fiction, and then uh, so I'm sorry, the two films on the are on the expropriation of uh, 500 families, I think, from uh, this building called White Building, and um, so this one started as a fiction, and then the expropriation happened. So he did a documentary, a chronicle, really of those, and then went back to white building. Um, the second person is um, uh, Fallin Young, who is also a trainee, and she was she was a trainee, and she graduated in 2015. Um, and then there is. Um, there is Sok Chand, uh, Chandaro with his beautiful film, The Sound of the Night. I'm going a little fast on this because I see time is uh, going really uh, fast. So the general impression that I got from all the films that I saw was they were human-centric, high-quality cinematography, single stories on real life, uh, going into uh, larger social concern concerns. And uh, embedded in most of them are Khmer Rouge war aftermath, but it looks like it is really uh, fading. Um, so some other uh, contemporary uh, filmmakers I, I met. So these two, I call them the visual poets, Ina Sotia and Pauline Lai, I think it's Pauline Lai actually, who are um, both uh, putting a lot of energy into the um, uh, the, the visual, but not only uh, into the, the visual. They both have received many prizes. And once this is online, you can uh, check their films. They started with Black and White, Rice, Love, uh, Life, Love, Bliss, and Iva, Eva, and Duetto are Black and White, and they're going into color. And actually, Ines is going into red and black. Her last film is red and black. Um, the uh, two others, which I called, uh, whom I called fiction poets, uh, dealing a lot with past and present in uh, Cambodia. Um, and this is Danek Sun with uh, one million dollar, uh, one million year, not dollar. I'm sure she would like one million dollar. So she won a first prize both at the Arte and the Singapore Short, Short Film Festival. And there's Sophia Kim here. Who is uh, who worked on the major productions? Un barrage contre le Pacifique, Le Portail de Regis Wagner, La Folie Almayer de Chantal Ackerman, uh, who are uh, French uh, uh, French people, <laughs> but uh, she's also uh, co-produced further and further away, Pauline Lai. And she is the author of this beautiful film, and I forgot to write the name, which is Grey Feathers. Um, and then there's Kulikar Soto, who has made a couple of uh, feature length films. So she is definitely a fiction writer with plot subplots. Um, and her film, The Last Reel, is the story of a teenager who is uh, discovering that her mother was a uh, famous actor, actress uh, in the, um, uh, before the Khmer Rouge. Then of course, documentaries, and I'm just gonna say a word of Van Ahem uh, and his film, uh, Lotus Sports Club, which is about the, uh, the trans uh, culture, not culture, trans people in, uh, in Phnom Penh. And this one is about, a trans inclusive uh, soccer team. And when I talked to him, so he's the only one I interviewed on, uh, on Zoom. And um, he, 
he was telling me that his film was had been nominated for a number of uh uh festivals and i just discovered last week that dong 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 he has actually been awarded a number of uh, things so finally independent uh let me talk to you about anti-archive which is a, a group uh, a producing company uh in uh in phnom penh uh started by david shu kevin nang and uh, steve chen and um, and from their website, what they say is that they are provocative, they want to be provocative. You see that the anti-archive is in itself um, very provocative, especially when you know that David Shu started with a uh, first film, uh, Golden Slumbers, on the um, uh, on past uh, filmmakers who survived the Khmer Rouge. Um, so I think whether they, I mean, I don't think, I know because I've met them also, they want to, what they say is that they want to rethink the relationship of film and filmmakers with past and history, not ignoring it, but going uh, further. And the company recognized the need for structure of film production in Cambodia. Um, so this is about them too. They made some, I mean, if you go on their website, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. They're doing some great film. And what's really important, they're trying to attract a younger audience. And my, um, I'm gonna explain in the, the conclusion that um, what's happening. So this is, these are the three first films I saw on contemporary Cambodia at the cinema, Le Saint-André des Arts in Paris, who organized a mini, mini festivals, three films in two days. Uh, this one on the left is uh, the um, is White Building. Uh, uh, this one is by David Chou, uh, Diamond Island. And this one was made by a French uh, filmmaker who actually lives in, Paris, in uh, Cambodia, and uh, uh, Philippe Miseli. Oh, I think I got his uh, first name wrong. But this is how I discovered that there was something else apart from Riti Pan. Um, they, they were there, but I didn't know. And this was in 2022 and 21. And this is when I changed actually my uh, the subject of my fellowship. Um, Okay, so there are challenges and questions. This is not an easy path for emerging cinema. Uh, this is what I gathered from interviews. There's a perceived gap of mentorship in the trade of cinema and in cinema culture. All the people I, um, I talked to um, mentioned this and they said that they, they really feel alone, like on an, on an iceberg and that cinema culture uh, is not uh, developed enough. There's an absence of literary story reading and story writing in schools and the younger generations um, are not used to slow filming and they're not used to uh, stories that develop around characters. They are, they've been fed by uh, uh, action movies and it's very difficult to attract them to the, uh, this kind of art movie, uh, art house movie. Not enough material, no dedicated school, film school. And this is where Bopana is at. You know, if, uh, according to me, has made a tremendous impact on making that cinema happen. Uh, some more challenges, uh, lack of public funding, and they have to rely too much on public donors, which means having to ask for money. And uh, it's very time consuming, uh, energy consuming. It's very difficult. This uh, Western influence, which somewhat uh, is slowing down Cambodia uh, cinema, they feel that they don't have their own voice. They depend a lot on Western um, images. And working also in a context where, and I'm quoting one of the cineasts I talked to, freedom speech is still fragile and provides a lot and causes, I'm sorry, a lot of self-censorship. So this was, also a reason that was given to me uh, for the slow development of contemporary um, filmmaking. But they are, I mean, this is, I discovered uh, the, 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 the fantastic side of all this is that there's a lot of resourcefulness, polyvalence, they all know how to do everything. 
their creativity is enormous in spite of the difficult political environment and the absence of public funding. They all have their own voice. Their films are very different. And they, you can see that there's really a cinema d'auteur behind. And they're all supporting each other, at least all the ones I met. Um, so I, I find, found that there was, a, there was really a good dynamic. The Phnom Penh Post, the uh, newspaper online, uh, is really, really paying attention. So maybe it's only rhetoric, I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of articles on the new films coming out, and uh, it's not, um, it's, it's good. Uh, and the uh, Cambodian film festivals are enormously successful. So I went back for the uh, International Film Festival, which it's not just a festival, it's a, La Fête. It's, it was fantastic. I was very, very impressed by it. And there's a lot of support coming from other Asian fin film uh, festivals, which I, I cannot cite here. So final question and I'm done. Has Bopana invented art house cinema in Cambodia and does it matter? Maybe yes, maybe no, okay. But in the current political, economical and social context, we cannot minimize the fact that Bopana has been profoundly impactful in Cambodia cinema in general. And I hope that I made the, uh, the, the bridge uh, between the two uh, obvious. And also cinema is profoundly impactful on social health, social issues, social development. Um, so I, I, I feel that there's, there's something important to say here. My goal was to make sense of this emergence, to perceive roots for me, Bupana, and signs of the present day uh, successes. And I want to thank you. And I'm sorry this was so long. And merci. Did you see it? Yes, I'm, let me turn on my video. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martine. Very interesting, very interesting um, perspective here and material that you presented. Um, there's a lot of directions we could go here and we do have time for um, some more discussion and questions and answers. I see we have a few in our Q&A box. Before we get to those, a um, couple of observations that I have just based on the material you, material you presented, um, there's a lot of directions I think we could go here, you know, um, it'd be interesting to focus in on, on some of the particular movies and, and new filmmakers, young filmmakers that you described and identified. Um, and also we could back up and maybe this is how I'd like to start our, our discussion now, um, by trying to put things into a larger historical context, um, spe specifically the Bopana Center. Um, one of the things that stuck out for me that you mentioned in your presentation is how Bopana and the ECCC both started in the same year, 2006. And it's interesting also to me that they paralleled each other in many ways um, mm -hmm. in that, yeah, I'd like to hear your perspective on that. You know, the ECCC kind of documented the, the Khmer Rouge period from a legal perspective and documented the historical facts of that period in a legal context. Um, and Bopana simultaneously um, documented the human lore of the human story, the individual human story in many ways. Um, and of course they collaborated directly and indirectly in this effort. As you mentioned, uh, one of the big projects of Bopana was to create the the free app, the Khmer Rouge app, which as you said, is incredibly well done. And I have it on my phone as well. And I refer to it frequently as well. It has a lot of documentary footage, a lot of photographs from the period, documentary photographs, and it's just so well done that it um, provides so much information. And it's in Khmer and in English. Um, so they paralleled the, the Bopana um, Audiovisual Resource Center and the ECCC have been sort of cousins in this effort to document the Khmer Rouge period in, in each of their different ways. I wonder if you have anything more that you could say about that. 
Well, I think you, uh, so uh, as you know, I'm not a historian and I definitely, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be very cautious about what I say, but I, I see that the Bupana was filling in a gap mm -hmm. compared to ECC. ECC was targeting a few, very few uh, responsible and Bupana was going very broad, very with breadth and at the level of the people who suffered instead of uh, so I see the yes I know that they were the parallel and I spoke at length with uh, one of the uh, the judges whom I happened to know through friends uh, and it, it was very evident that the, the the goals were very different but they completed each other mm. and uh, uh, the the human side of Bupana for me uh, is of course what attracts me the most, but I can see and I know where they collaborated. Don't ask me too many details on this because I have not, you know, I have not gone into uh, too many details. I mean, on the uh, on, on the details on this, but yes, I agree. But uh, you know, the the coincidence of the two days maybe it was not a coincidence, but for me it was really um, interesting. So mm -hmm. I probably did not answer your question fully because you're the historian, I'm not, but uh, yes. No, I, I think the, they did, as you say, um, they were very complementary, and they, they each, um, you know, there's so many perspectives that need to be um, viewed, you know, to the, that need to be seen in order to completely understand what's happened, obviously, and you will never completely understand what happened, but all of these perspectives do, complement each other, the literary, the legal, the cinemagraphic, et cetera. Um, yeah, um, another observation um, that I was hoping you could talk about is the emphasis on documentary filmmaking. Um, it seems perhaps obvious that this would happen, but it's an interesting almost phenomenon that it, again, in the aftermath of the KR period that so much efforts was done initially, um, certainly in the 90s and early 2000s and 80s as well, on documenting, preserving, collecting um, what remained of a, of a destroyed culture in many ways and reviving it and restoring it. Um, and the Bopana Center certainly was a major, played a major role in that effort. So I guess it's not surprising that documentary filmmaking would be the genre to emerge mm -hmm. out of this effort and now continue in new and interesting ways, documenting not just the legacy of the Khmer Rouge period, but the post Khmer Rouge period, as you, as you mentioned at, at, towards the end of your um, presentation, but certainly the documentary style, the docudrama style as, as well, um, certainly has emerged as a preeminent genre amongst these new art house cinematographers. Right. Um, so I always go back to what was shown, what was made in terms of film uh, before 2000. And, you know, I, same thing, I, I did not, uh, I was not able in that short time to really dig too, too deep, but I did not find anything that was going into the documentary vein genre at all. Uh, not until, uh, until the Ruti Pan came, came up. I mean, it, it, of course he was trained in France and he started, you know, in the, um, so it's it's very complicated for me because I wish that I had found more from before, more um, uh, Cambodian uh, documentary that were made maybe, I don't know, in the, the 1990s. I haven't found anything. And maybe some people will say, oh, you know, there's this and that. But for me, it only started then. But documentary is very popular in France. It's a genre that, that people uh, really like. Uh, we, uh, we we go to the cinema, we see documentaries, there's a lot of small uh, theaters that show only documentaries. And the 1960s, um, so my my perspective on the uh, social documentaries in the, in the 60s is that cinema provoked 1968 in France. Without cinema, it would not have had the, uh, imp the, the importance, it would not have blown up 
and the 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 um, the, the producer I work on, which was started by uh, Chris Marker, had a film called uh, "A Bientôt J'espère" in 1967 on the strikes that were happening in France that really um, antagonized people, and they made them. Uh, revolt and that was 68 so we we forget that there was a number of films uh documentaries that that made things happen this is not what Riti Pan is doing and I don't think the political context would allow this this but the the genre itself allows a lot of uh fiction because for me documentary is fiction because you frame you create a story you edit to convince um but at the same time you talk about situations that are real that people can recognize in their everyday life or somebody else's everyday life they can refer to them so for me it's not it's not a surprise that it is uh the the documentary has emerged but i what i'm seeing now uh, at this point is that it has um, we may be going beyond this. And Davi Shu, his last film, for example, actually his last two films, uh, um, oh my gosh, Retour à Seoul and um, uh, Golden Slumber. So Golden Slumber is, uh, not, uh, sorry, uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, Diamond Island, sorry. Diamond Island is a documentary, but there's a lot of, fiction type cinematography in it. And then of course, uh, Retour à Seoul is fictional, but it talks about real things. So the mixing of documentary and fiction is, uh, is very present. And I think it's going towards more fiction, which for me is going to maybe attract more younger audiences. I'm not sure. I don't know if I answered your no, question. No, that's, but... Yeah, that's interesting. You brought up another um, interesting point that um, kind of leads into this next comment or question that I have um, regarding, as you said, the importance of documentary style in Europe and France, especially, um, and its important role in the 1960s. Um, of course, as you mentioned, also, Riti Pan did his, um, uh, his film studies at the prestigious, prestigious um, film school EDEC. Is that how it's pronounced? Um, and yeah, and the um, the question I have now is: are, are you familiar with the Cambodian architect uh, Van Molivan? Yes, I, I am. Mm -hmm. Of course, right. Um, so you know, it, it struck me that I'm wondering if you would agree with the observation or the analogy that Riti Pan is a little bit like the Van Molivan of of contemporary Khmer cinema. Yes. Um, uh, okay. I, let me just finish the comment and then yes, in, in the fact that, um, you know, the way Van Malivan used, um, you know, French knowledge to pursue his vision of what it means to be Khmer in the um, post-independence period, um, it seems perhaps um, legitimate to say that uh, Ritipan is doing something similar. Uh, you know, he used his knowledge of French cinema to um, help him pursue his vision of what it means to be Khmer in the post-KR period. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, you know, I, I it's hard for me to come to terms with the influence of France uh, in uh, in Cambodia. Uh, I uh, I had a lot of soul searching when I was there, including with what I was doing, and uh, it's of course. Uh, Paul Potts was in France. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was in France. So the uh, you know you you take you take from the other what resembles you also. And I think that maybe uh, I don't know. I'm just uh, maybe Richie Pan would have uh, done the same thing if he had stayed in if he had been in Cambodia the whole time had not been a refugee. I really don't know how things would have gone, but it's interesting that, and in, a, um, in the uh, the missing picture, L'image manquante, he talks very well of the uh, his his uh, his attraction to cinema very young as a uh, as a young child, and uh, his neighbors or his uncle, I can't remember now who had this. So I agree with 
I agree, and then I'm a little uncomfortable. It worked very well for Riti Pan, for Van Manivan also. It worked terribly bad for somebody else who studied in France and came back, you know, and theorist. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. Yeah, it's a complicated topic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, well, thanks so very much for, for responding to those comments. Um, so let's, we did have a couple comments, uh, questions and answers. So let me- I, I am not seeing the questions. I don't know where they are. Oh, I see. I have to say, Q, Q, I have to push Q and A. Oh my gosh, these are long. Okay. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read them and then yes. uh, please respond. So um, uh, Professor John Marston here, um, has a question. Um, of course, John is the um, CKS scholar in residence this year. Um, he asks if you are familiar with the filmmaker um, um, Kalyani Mam, um, who did the film about the Tonle Sap, how the Tonle Sap reverses the life on the Tonle Sap River. And she's done mm -hmm. other um, documentary style films. Um, she was not a I don't believe affiliated with the Bopana Center. She was more um, uh, working with the Documentation Center of Cambodia, DC Camp. Yeah, yep. another documentary style filmmaker, certainly these days. Um, um, another comment here by uh, uh, someone who just did a presentation for us, um, Linda Sapan, um, who, who I'm sure you're aware of. Um, and she, I know you were speaking very broad terms and painting with a brush when you were comparing the um, 1950s and 60s and early 70s filmmaking in Cambodia with contemporary filmmaking, but she just wants to um, highlight that there was um, some you know, non-horror style, um, some very important filmmaking done during that period that was very serious and very um, you know, human story based. Uh -huh. And she did a great presentation on the, well, um, the woman uh, cinematographer, um, Sita Ulm, who did some very mm. interesting work on a very deep psychological level um, about women's roles in Cambodia, et cetera. But yes. of course you were speaking in very broad terms, I, I know, um, but there, there, there was a lot more depth to that period. Yes. And um, just as today, there's still the same kind of horror films being produced that um, were produced back then. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, for Linda, I saw her comment, and I actually have, uh, I have her book, um, and uh, I, I knew when I added this slide, it was just for effects, and uh, obviously I made a mistake. I added a uh, film in the, in Thai language, which I didn't know. And uh, thank you. I really accept the uh, the criticism, uh, and I will look into it. So yes, it was very broad for me. It was. Yeah, so this is what I was saying earlier. Maybe somebody is going to tell me that, but uh, that I was wrong there, and I I totally accept the uh, uh, I accept that, um, and I hope we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, let's just go through a few more of these. A lot of these are just uh, thank yous, but um, Lena Khan um, asked the question: What can be done to improve? the plots of, of the movies that seem dull to yes. her. Um, and you mentioned that this is happening um, and there's a lot of things going on in that. So this, this was a, a big part of my conversation at the, uh, the ministry, the, the department of uh, cinema uh, with the Borak Bok, Bok Borak. And uh, he said that he wanted to do more uh, workshops on screen, uh, on screenwriting that he was very uh, he realized that and he wanted to the government to to pay to offer uh, workshops on screenwriting uh, so I think he's very aware of this but I'm also um, not concerned but I noticed that there's very little literature that is being studied in uh, in schools and in University. So how do I know that? It's because I talk to people, but I don't know for a fact. I try to get uh, invited to talk to people at the uh, city about this, and I was I never got a response. For me, reading, understanding plots when you read or when you consume plot, 
will make you uh, uh, maybe want to create more. It's very difficult to do a subplot or several subplots around a big, you know, a, a major plot to make a feature length film and to, um, to, to you know, to create a, a film that will keep the audience for an hour and a half. So for me, it's it's very simple. Uh, not it's very simple. It's very complicated, actually. It's more reading, but I don't know if there is a literature, a Khmer literature right now. Uh, you know, novels um, that that is uh, sufficient to be to be taught right now. And I uh, and these are all these are a lot of questions. Okay, that I have for myself. But several of the filmmakers I. Uh, I uh, spoke with mentioned that they said kids don't have the time, the patience for this kind of uh, exercise. So you, you know, it's it just feeds your your brain. It feeds your your imagination when you read, and I think that that is missing. And right now, it's just reproducing a lot of horror. Um, just yes, but Linda is not going to be happy. So. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, for me, it's it's more it's more than filming. It's just knowing what it is, you know, and and building characters and uh, um, and actually, uh, Danek Sun has a wonderful interview on Arte where she talks about this uh, with great ideas. Um, but it it takes a lot of time because many people have one idea, you know, of something they want to do, but creating something broader, wider, to um, uh, to create a full uh, length uh, feature film is is very hard. Thank you for that. Um, yes, uh, I can just say briefly that there is a emerging literary scene in Cambodia now. Um, you know, Bopana works very closely with um, Cambodian living arts, um, mm -hmm. and um, you know the um, a, a former um, program director there, Sopina. Um, is very much at the forefront of that new literary movement and several other writers are coming along. Um, you know, I think, you know, just my own personal observation, we'll see a, a greater, um, you know, literary, bigger literary scene emerging in the years to come, which undoubtedly, as you point out, will feed into um, development of stories and understanding and um, basically the, the complexity of storytelling and understanding stories that are told. Um, let me move on. Um, so another question, um, how do you see the connection between Bopana Center and the new Cambodian filmmakers coming out of the anti-archive, for instance? You know, of course, as you mentioned already, um, well, <laughs> they, they came out of the Bopana Center, um, yes. for example. So the the I think it's a great connection. Uh, you know, I I can I, I, I mean, uh, Kevi came out of Bopana. He was trained by by Riti Pan, so that's uh, that's one of the connections. Uh, and it's it's hard. I I the, the name for me is is uh, is complicated. Uh, we I've talked to them about it because anti is not beyond anti is against something, so I was a little puzzled by this. But I think they they really want to to show that uh, there are other aspirations than uh, films about the past, about tragedy of the past. I think it's going to continue to be a very uh, respectful and warm relationship. That's all I can say. I, I cannot talk for them, and uh, but I, have, I talk to both of them separately, and I know that they respect each other highly and uh, and and value what each one is doing. Great, thank you. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of great synergy there. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, let me move down to the next question. Um, this question by Eric White. Could you just could you discuss the domestic reception of the art house cinema more? If the general public is not receptive to it, what social segments of the local scene are paying attention to what's I coming agree. up? In the art house cinema? Yes. Well, this is uh, so Bopana. I think the the uh, the Bopana films are made for uh, policymakers 
larger NGOs, uh, people who will decide on things, and I think they're doing. The department, I will do. I think that's um, uh, okay. Do I have to do something there? No. Uh, the uh, it's yes. So you know, when you're fearful, you just don't do something. And it, I think it's more self censorship. And I don't know how far they could go. Uh, these filmmakers in uh, talking about more complicated issues. Um, but I arrived on uh, in Phnom Penh on. Uh, February 9th, and you may remember that February 9th was the day VOD closed. So it was actually on the 11th, but I arrived on the 9th. So uh, VOD closed uh, uh, the day after I arrived. So things happen still. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go too much in details on that because. Um... Oh, thank you. Linda Sapan had another comment. Um, saying that uh, the, the Documentation Center of Cambodia, DC CAM, um, also worked a lot, of course, as we know, with the um, ECCC, um, in fact, was one of the main drivers for the creation of the ECCC, and of course, provided much of the evidentiary materials that were used um, in the trials, um, and also produced, and we mentioned um, Kalyan Imam, but yes. many, many other documentaries and quite a bit of production in that extent. Um, to what extent do you, are you aware of, of there being collaboration between DC CAM and the uh, Bohana Center? I really, I, I don't know. Uh, a couple of filmmakers I talked to, you know, uh, played with both, but the trajectory I followed for my, for that, uh, this trip and this uh, fellowship was I started with Riti Pan. And then I went into uh, I went to uh, to you know to Bopana Center, and then I, so I I really focus on that. So I really don't know much about this. I'm not going to pretend I do. I was there for a short time, um, and so I I don't know, but it's I'm sure that uh, that it is true, and the name came up often, and this is uh, yes. Great, thank you. Um, next question from Leslie Barnes. Um, she asks about the, the movie Diamond Island. You, uh, she's wondering to what extent um, it's documentary with fictional elements or is it more fictional? She understood it to be more of a drama than a documentary. Well, um, so when I saw it the first time in Paris, I thought so too. Then I went to Diamond Island and um, I realized that the the the, the fiction. Uh, I mean, it, as I said earlier, for me, there's very the, the, the line between fiction. Uh, yes, there is a drama. There's all that, but at the same time, it is documenting something that's happening in in, uh, in Diamond Island right now. Uh, you know, the construction, the the. Uh, uh, the people living around it and the camps and all that, you cannot say that it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't exist. So I think that uh, Davi says that they're fictionalized documentaries. So this is, you know, you take a situation that is really there And then you create characters who are fictional yes, yes, to your uh, uh, interest and in study of Modiano. Yes. Right, known for doing auto fiction, I believe it's called, where yes. his um, life during World War II is documented in his fiction. Um, okay, next question from Derek Schilling. Um, thank you, Martin. You mentioned many Cambodian filmmakers depend on private donations to finance their projects, and their public funding is lacking. Is there any government support for film production in Cambodia? Well, not that I um, not that I could see. 
uh, the uh, as I said when I went to uh, to the Department of Cinema, uh, it was clear that money was not going towards art house cinema except maybe for workshops. Um, and but they each one of the, the filmmakers I talked to mentioned this. They they would like to see a circular uh, economy around cinema a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm going to say like in France, but you know you. The, the 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 government would help uh and then there would be more films longer films maybe more audience and that would bring money to a, a um uh, to the kiss you know just like lucien say or um so right now there's it's two it's two separate it's really one little thing on the side and which has no connection and actually most of the prizes that the uh that in the, uh, the the funding that they get from other governments are not from Cambodia. Busan has been uh, funding them a lot, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you. This kind of connects to a question, I'll, I'll skip one of them and then come back to it. Um, but the question that says, okay, so there's no government support and you mentioned that most people depend on private funding, um, which, from my understanding with my conversation with Linda Sapan um, a couple months ago, um, mm -hmm. that, is, that was not so untrue in the 1950s and 60s where many filmmakers were basically working out of their homes and um, doing it in their spare time. Um, it seems to be a similar situation now that depending on private funding is really um, the only way that people can produce films. How difficult is it for people to find that private funding? Well, what I heard, and again, I am not a filmmaker, so I'm, I've not done it, but what I heard is that they spend as much time looking for money than filming and editing. Filming is easy, as we all know. You know, you can take a film is easy. What is difficult is the post-production and then finding uh, finding out, outlets for, for films. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I and I'm, I'm thinking about, I mean, I'm not giving names of the, but I know uh, one of the last persons I interviewed said, I have to go back to work. He was going back to a bank because he had a day job because he couldn't. So there's, they, they have to do a lot of uh, work on their own to, to make a living, uh, let alone making, you know, picture length movies. So that's, that's very, um, so I know it is hard, uh, but I've not done it, so I don't know how hard it is really in real life. But this was a, a this was a uh, uh, a comment that was made by each one of them. Maybe I was asking the question. I don't know, but it came up in every conversation. Not surprising, I don't think that it would be difficult. Um, our last question is from Trisha Kun. Um, she uh, could you talk a little bit more about how Bopana engages young people in um, in um, learning the art of filmmaking. Um, you, we, you did talk about the 14 um, young people who are selected each year to work on um, mm -hmm. a short film. Uh, um, could you talk about that a little bit more? Um, well, yes, yeah, so the 16 to 20, um, from what I understood uh, and uh, was told, they, they are from very different backgrounds. Some of them are university trained. Some of them had some uh, uh, film or journalism training, like Fali Nong, whom uh, mm -hmm. about whom I, I talked earlier. Uh, and some names because I want, but I was told also that some of them barely write and read, that writing and reading is not necessarily uh, the, the base for good filming, that seeing life through a lens is very different from being able to talk about it writing. So they come from very different backgrounds and different trainings, uh, and they seem to be working along very well and learning from each other. And so the, the article I'm writing, I'm writing right now, I, I cite a few of them who said, oh, what I did in finance helped me now understand uh, what I see in terms of poverty. I know it's gonna be hard for people to come out of poverty because of what I did. Or um, so, so they, they, their background, what they did before, where they come from, the languages they, they speak, uh, 
kind of feeds the group, you know, they all learn to each other, they all teach each other what they, they have in themselves um, to, um, uh, yes. So the, uh, so, and they're very young. And I did not say this, but uh, the, the, the Mekong um, film has, the, it has a subtitle, which is wonderful. Uh, I think it's stimulating the youth That, but it's small. It's twelve, twelve a year, or twelve of thirteen or fourteen a year. It's, it's it's super small. So there's another school like this, which is uh, pour un sourire d'enfant, and um, they have also a school, so the PSE uh, in, uh, uh, and they have also a film school. Uh, but kids have to qualify. They have to really be part of the poorest of the poorest to be able to go there. So I mean, it's not, it's it's great, but uh, so it's it looks like the two film schools that exist at this point are uh, NGOs pretty much, um, right. not government organized. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, that brings us to the end of the questions and the end of our presentation today. Um, unless there's any final comments that you'd like to make, well, I, uh, I cannot tell you how uh, thankful I am for having been chosen on a project that was not um, very well baked. And uh, uh, so th this was wonderful. I probably made many mistakes. I was my first time there. I was discovering a whole uh, landscape, a, a whole paysage uh, du cinéma uh, that uh, not shocked me, but surprised me. And I was, so I learned enormously that I know that, but I didn't learn enough, probably, and I know I probably made some misinterpretations, and I'm ready to correct this if needed. But I want to thank the uh, Center for Khmer Studies for its trust in me. This was uh, this was really fantastic, and I'm a few years away from uh, retirement, and I think that I have found a uh, I have something new that I'm, I really care about. Mm, that's wonderful. Well, Martine, thank you again so much for joining us today. And um, I'm sorry I was so long. <laughs> no, I, we're still under time, actually, so we're fine. Okay. Um, so it was very interesting, very insightful, and I appreciate it very much, very provocative. Um, clearly, there's a lot more to do in this field um, and a lot more coming down the road in terms of new film production in Cambodia and, um, you know, the, the great talent that exists here. Um, we'll be looking yes. forward to seeing how that all. Thank you, and thank you very much for everybody to get up so early or go to bed late uh, to be here. That, that was, that was uh, very exciting for me. Thank you. Thank you, George. You're welcome. It was great having you. Well, thank you.